So if you live in a big city, I'm guessing this is going to be a familiar scene to you. Every year, cars get better. They get safer. We build more highways, but there's no end to traffic, right? Soon, these cars are going to drive themselves, right? The people I worked with are now trying to make these commercial, and these cars will drive by themselves. But don't expect your commute time to get any shorter. I'm going to guess that if you're like me, you have sat in inching traffic and just had this thought, what if we could just sort of rise above this and fly? You know, you're getting late to your play or your movie or your date, wherever, and you just, I'm sure you've had this thought, right? Um, so let's ask a question. We've had aircraft for over 100 years, and why don't we fly? So if you look at aviation today, it's really optimized for travel between cities. Um, if you are traveling for the holidays, you're going to see this kind of a scene very soon. <laughs> um, and that's because airports are large, complex centers of infrastructure which are really optimized to take a lot of people from one place to another. Um, airline traffic, airline travel today is also dependent on these guys. Okay? They are pilots who spend a lot of their time training to be able to fly you safely from one airport to another. So here's the problem. Airline, demand for airline transportation is growing at about 5% a year. And the availability of these kinds of pilots is decreasing. Partly that's because the cost of pilot training is actually gone double over the last 20 years. And in the next 20 years, we expect that we'll have a shortage of up to 35,000 pilots. So what does this mean, right? Congestion on the ground, inching traffic, and then when you go try to fly, you're going to spend long hours at, on layovers, cancel flights. Isn't there any other way? Well, I, I just want you to remember two things. If we're going to rem disrupt transportation, we're going to have to deal with airports and train pilots. So this thought has been around for a long time, OK? A hundred years ago, we were thinking in the age of the coming automobile, becoming popular, we were thinking about the aerobile. In 1924, popular science had this idea in just a little while, it was going to be possible for you to live in the suburbs and fly to work. And they claimed that it would be quicker and safer to fly to work than it would be to drive to work on roads and highways. A little ahead of their time, I think you'll agree. So that didn't happen, but here's what we got in the 1960s. In the age of rocketry and the, then airplane travel becoming popular, we got the Jetsons. Now, what many people forget is the Jetsons were thinking about not the 22nd century or the 23rd century, they were thinking we would be flying to work today. So in the 1960s, Flying cars had captured the public imagination, and people were thinking, well, what if we could park this thing in our driveway and then just somehow or the other get to where we're going? So now, fast forward to a little bit longer, a little bit after that, uh, we started to see these kinds of vehicles come into being, okay? They were the first vehicles other than helicopters that looked like they were the, f they could be the flying cars. They in 1962, the U.S. Army commissioned what was the first air jeep to be able to take off from anywhere and land anywhere. It only flew for a few minutes, and it was really difficult to control, but that was the first flying car I'm going to uh, give you. The year that I was born, there were already people uh, doing this kind of thing. Okay, so we can get rid of airports, but okay, we still need trained pilots. So fast forward 50 years, and now we are at the cusp of a completely new type of air travel. So these aren't just artists' imaginations, they're that, but also these are vehicles that are likely to come to being and be flying in the next few years. And the revolutionary concept is this, that of course they can take off and land anywhere, but you're gonna get inside one of them, or this is the concept at least, and press a button, and it will fly you to where you need to go. So the second piece, right? 
You don't need airports. You gotta need, don't need trained pilots. So this is where my story comes in. For the last 15 years, what I've been doing is I've been developing aircraft of all sizes that fly by themselves. Small ones, big ones, and possibly the ones that will actually guide um, airline travel or air, air travel in the future, the flying cars of the future. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to boil down a whole bunch of stuff that I've been doing for the last 15 years into what is it that's going to be necessary for these things to be good enough that you would get on one of them or put your kid in one of them and send them off to their violin lesson. You know, press the button, go. Right? So here's what I'm going to contend. The aircraft of the future that will have to fly safely, have to fly credibly, are going to have to do two, three things. They're going to have to fly safe, land safe, and then do it without GPS. So fly safe part is easy, right? Fly safe is aircraft is flying along, something in its way that it hadn't planned on, it detects it, it avoids it, and then goes on its way. Land safe is like you're flying along and suddenly the aircraft has to pull over for some reason. It has to be able to make sure that it lands without landing on a hazard or on some object. You know, if you have a chance of landing next to the highway, not on the highway, the vehicle should be able to do that automatically. The do it without GPS, I'm going to take a minute and I'll explain that to you what that's about. So what I want to do is I just want to show you how we turn a vehicle, a familiar vehicle, into a self-piloted aircraft. So here's an animation of a helicopter that what we can do is we can send it computer signals and then it flies based on those computer signals. We also put some sensors in the front. We'll put a laser scanner in the front and then we'll put computers in the back. Laser scanner will take measurements, hundreds of thousands of measurements um, per second. It will try to make sense out of that in the back on the computers and the vehicle will guide itself and land itself safely. Here it is, it's flying and what it's doing is it's um, making measurements as it flies, looking at things in front and looking at things below and making this kind of a map so it can actually fly safe and land safe. So this is all data that's coming in, created into a map in real time, and it's used, that data is used to be able to make these kinds of determinations. To, to show you how this works, I'm gonna take you to an actual experiment we conducted for a mock casualty evacuation scenario for the Army. The Army is concerned about not having to put more people at risk when they go get somebody uh, that has been injured. So the idea is, could you have an autonomous vehicle fly to the location of a casualty, find a uh, safe place to land, and land there? So this is the first time anyone had ever flown a full-scale helicopter fully autonomously. And uh, what you see is, here's a helicopter. It approaches. It's been told where the casualty is, roughly. And what it's going to do is it's going to build this kind of a map. And this is a replay of data from that experiment quickly determines places that are too rough or too sloped, not good, uh, not good to land, and then among them will pick a site which is not too close to wires, trees, and buildings. So you can see vehicle approaches, flies over, and without loitering, it circles around, it's already picked a place, and what it's gonna do is land. Okay, land safely. So this is 2010, first time a helicopter had ever flown take off to landing, had made its own decisions, chosen a place to land and landed safely. What I didn't tell you here is that part that I kept from you, which is the last part, which is do it without GPS. For this kind of technology to work, it ha the vehicle has to hundreds of times a second determine where it is and what's around it, okay? So today, GPS is absolutely necessary for that. So in fact, if GPS were to even go away for a few minutes because a satellite fails or it's being jammed or it's being blocked for some reason, these aircraft will literally fall out of the sky. So we've been working on saying, well, if we cannot have GPS to tell the vehicle where it is and where to land, how would this vehicle work? So I'm going to take you to an experiment that might look like it's something quite different than flying. What we're going to do is I'm sure going to show you an experiment from somebody running and jumping with a laser scanner bolted to their head. So this is a, sort of a scientist ninja, which you'll see, right? So here it is. My colleague, G, is going to run, and he's going to jump, and he's got a laser scanner on his head, 
And what you're seeing here is data from that laser scanner in real time as it's coming in. But then he has a little computer in his backpack that's able to take all that data, collate it together, and in hundreds of times a second, locate where that laser scanner is and the map that's around it, okay? So this is all done in real time. So now what we can do is we can fly safe, land safe, and do this all without GPS. So let me show you how that works. Here's an aircraft that in its final descent, it's going A to B. It doesn't use any GPS. It's building this kind of map. And what you're seeing here is a, what we call a point cloud based on millions of range measurements, distance measurements that it's taking as it flies and putting it together. So here it is. Um, let's see. Here it is. It's flying, uh, building this map. You can see the, the map evolving. Turns out that there is a farm machine right in its way, so the vehicle is able to notice it, detect it, and then safely plan a path around it and land safely. So here you see what we have is all of the building blocks for fly safe, land safe, and do it without GPS. What's new is actually the components are now becoming small and the software can run on non-exotic computers. What it takes to run this kind of stuff is something that's in your laptops today. You can see the kind of maps this vehicle is, uh, starts to build as it is going, and it can understand the environment, make decisions based on this environment. So let me come back to the question I started with. It is 2017, so where are the flying cars? So I've been fortunate enough to work on both the driving side on the flying side, right? I've shown you the basic building blocks. The technology is here, most of it is here. There's a lot more work to be done, okay? But where we go with this, how this stuff becomes commonplace is really a question of economics and of policy. Economics would be simple to understand, like how much are you willing to pay to fly to work in 10 minutes rather than 40 minutes, right? So that's an equation that we're going to have to solve. This is a human kind of a thing. How much do we value that? Um, the second one is an issue of policy. What kind of risk are we willing to take? Okay, in some cases, it may be very easy to justify this. In fact, some of the people we work with said, if we had these kinds of cars, if we had these kinds of vehicles, they would be used in Puerto Rico a few months ago or a few weeks ago when they had to deliver uh, supplies and they didn't have any roads, they didn't have any way to get there, okay? So it's really actually about a human factor. So I keep getting this question, cars or airplanes, which ones are coming first, the ones that drive? If you ask me, I say, why drive autonomously when you can fly autonomously? <laughs> so I say, look up and let's fly. Thank you. Thank you.